Turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus. We are in Exodus chapter 18 this morning. As we come into chapter 18, we've seen that the Israelites have been getting a crash course as it pertains to knowing their God, the one true Lord, and in growing in their relationship with Him. After all, as slaves in Egypt for nearly 400 years, the Israelites really didn't have much contact with God at this time, so their faith was really weak. But then God revealed himself to Moses at the burning bush we saw in Midian. Again, Moses was a Jew. He was raised in the courts of Pharaoh, and for 40 years he lived in the courts of Pharaoh. Um, when Moses was about 40 years old, he saw an Egyptian beating an Israelite, and he went to the Israelites' defense, and Moses intervened and killed the Egyptian. But when Pharaoh found out about this, he wanted to kill Moses, and so Moses fled. And he arrived in Midian, and which is present-day Saudi Arabia, not the Sinai Peninsula, but he arrives in Midian, and there he would meet Jethro, uh, the priest of Midian. He would give Moses his daughter Zipporah as a wife, and then they would have two children together, uh, Gershom and Eliezer. And it was after 40 years in Midian as Moses was content uh, being a shepherd, taking care of his father-in-law Jethro's sheep, that the Lord would call Moses he would equip him, then he would send him back to Egypt to stand before Pharaoh and demand that Pharaoh let God's people go. And as you know, Pharaoh dug in his heels. And so God reveals himself in the most incredible ways to his people, the Israelites, because of Pharaoh's hard heart, God sent the ten plagues. And the tenth plague was the worst, the death of the firstborn. It affected Pharaoh's own son. And that was the straw, in a sense, that broke the camel's back. And Pharaoh demanded Moses leave. Get out of here. I don't want you here anymore. And so they left. And now they've been wandering in the wilderness for about three months. But the biggest lesson the Israelites learned with that tenth plague was when the death angel passed over the land of Egypt and saw the blood of the lamb on their doorposts, on the lintel, then he would pass over those houses that had the blood of the lamb and everyone inside was spared. And over the last few months, God has been giving the Israelites a crash course about who he is, how much he loves them, and how he wants to bless them. And that's in spite of the fact that they have been grumbling and complaining throughout their time in the wilderness. But God was revealing himself to them as their deliverer, as their protector, as their provider, as their savior, as the ultimate leader. And so God has been giving them manna from heaven. Uh, we saw last time he gave them water from the rock. Paul says the rock was Jesus. And he just gave them victory over the Amalekites as they tried to attack uh, the Israelites. So God has been taking them through uh, what I like to call the desert discipleship program. Uh, the goal is that they would learn to trust the Lord with their whole hearts. Uh, and in the same way, you and I, we've been enrolled in the desert discipleship program as well. We're on a different journey with different circumstances, but the goal is the same. God wants us to learn to trust Him, to depend upon Him, and to know how much He loves us, and He wants us to grow in that love relationship with Him. So every challenge in life that we face and in every battle that we fight, God is wanting us to lean into Him, learn from Him, depend on Him, and be assured that He will see you through. So look at chapter 18, verse 1. We'll get through the chapter, Lord willing, this morning. It says, And Jethro, don't think of the Beverly Hillbillies when you think of that. All you young people are like, Who? <laughs> And Jethro, the priest of Midian, Moses' father-in-law, heard of all that God had done for Moses and for Israel, his people, that the Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. Now, who were the Midianites? Well, they were descendants of Abraham's second wife. After Sarah died, he remarried this gal named Keturah, and one of her sons was Midian. And so the Midianites, that's where he comes from. They were pagan 
uh, worshiping idol type of people. But as we'll see, Jethro, his father-in-law, seems to have come to a belief in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Once again, Moses spent 40 years in Midian with Jethro. I'm sure they talked a lot of religious stuff over those 40 years. But now it's been about 15 months since Moses left Midian and went back to Egypt. So when he, they left, he was there for about a year during the plagues, the 10 plagues. And then the last three months, it's been out in the wilderness. So Jethro now will meet up with him, and it's going to be a great time. As we'll see, Jethro is really going to grow in his faith and in his trust in the Lord um, again, after Moses tells him all that God has done. So uh, Moses' testimony, it was huge in Jethro's life. Don't ever think that your testimony isn't a big deal. It is. God has done amazing things in your life, and he wants to use your testimony of what Jesus has done for you to minister to others. You know, that's the basic meaning behind verses like Romans 10, 17, you know, our theme verse for our church, it's been for 30, almost 34 years. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Just tell people the word of God and what God has done for us. So sometimes it simply, you know, it just boils down to sharing your testimony about the Lord and all that he's doing in your life. So Jethro, verse 2, it says, Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back, with her two sons, of whom the name of one was Gershom, for he, is, he said, I have been a stranger in a foreign land. So that's where the name Gershom means, a stranger. And the name of the other was Eliezer, for he said, the God of my father was my help. So God is my helper. And delivered me from the sword of Pharaoh. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness where he was encamped at the mountain of God, again, Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai. Now he had said to Moses, I, your father-in-law Jethro, am coming to you with your wife and her two sons with her. So again, it's been over a year since Moses saw his wife and his two sons. And if you remember there... Last goodbye was not a pleasant experience. Uh, from chapter 4, if you remember, Moses, Zipporah, the two boys, probably not boys, they're probably in their 20s, they're heading to Egypt together, and just before they get to Egypt, God stops them, and he's about to kill Moses. And you're like, why? Because the Lord told him, you did not circumcise your son. So what does his wife do? She sharpens a rock. I would hope it would be a very sharp rock. And she circumcises her son. She takes the foreskin and throws it at Moses' feet. And she yells at him, Surely you are a man of blood to me, or a husband of blood to me. So God let Moses live. Moses goes by himself to Egypt, and his family returns to Jethro, Zipporah's dad. And so that's where they would be during the ten plagues. So here we see Jethro coming out to greet Moses with the family. So hopefully it's a joyous family reunion. Verse 7, So Moses went out to meet his father-in-law, bowed down, and kissed him. And they asked each other about their well-being, and they went into the tent. And Moses told his father-in-law all that the Lord had done to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians for Israel's sake, all the hardship that had come upon them on the way, and how the Lord had delivered them. So no doubt the tears were flowing. There's rejoicing as Moses meets his family and Jethro. And I'm sure they saw this huge change in Moses' life because last time they saw Moses, he was a shepherd over Jethro's sheep. And now he's back, and he is God's shepherd over two and a half to three million Israelites. It's a huge change. He's got all these people, and we'll find out later, they're all in order in their tribes. You know, they'll be around the future tabernacle that they will build. But Jethro, he's probably witnessed the pillar of cloud by day, because it was there every day, the presence of the Lord, the pillar of fire at night. I'm sure you saw the tons of manna that was distributed every morning and then the water gushing forth from the rock 
And so, as we'll see, this was all at the base of Mount Sinai there in Midian. So Jethro, I'm sure he was just blown away as Moses retells the stories of what God did to Egypt and how God just delivered them and brought them through the Red Sea and how God, you know, brought the walls of water down upon the Egyptian army. And so it's just been one thing after another. So how did Moses' father-in-law react when he hears this amazing story from Moses? Well, look at verse 9. Then Jethro rejoiced for all the good which the Lord, and when you see the Lord in your Bible, all capital letters, that's Yahweh, so he rejoiced for all the good which the Lord had done for Israel, whom he had delivered out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord. This is Jethro talking. Again, this Gentile Midianite. Blessed be the Lord who has delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh and who has delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all the gods for in the very thing in which they behaved proudly, he, again, Yahweh, was above them. Then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, took a burnt offering and other sacrifices to offer to God. And Aaron came with all the elders of Israel to eat bread with Moses' father-in-law before God. And so what an awesome scene this is, because here's Jethro, again, this Gentile who's now worshiping, he's sacrificing with Moses and Aaron and all the elders of Israel. I mean, he's a changed man. He totally recognizes and believes that the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh, is the one true living God over all of his creation. So even before the law was given to Moses... Even before the law was given at the uh, you know, Mount Sinai, we'll see that in chapter 20. Even before that, we see Jews and Gentiles worshiping the Lord together. So this kind of worship and fellowship with the Lord, it, it would look forward to the time when Jesus would come, he would die on the cross, he would shed his blood for the sins of the world, and then he would bring the Jews and Gentiles together and form the body of Christ, the bride of Christ. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2 says of Jesus, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That means he satisfied God's wrath for sin, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek or the Gentile. So the, the gospel, that's the power of God to change anybody's life. Doesn't matter what you've done, doesn't matter how many sins you've committed, God loves you and he sent Jesus to die for you. His blood is the only acceptable sacrifice for your sins. And it's the power of God for everyone who believes. That's your part. You have to believe. You have to trust. Receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. Jesus simply says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And so again, the gospel of Christ, his death on the cross for your sins, his burial, his resurrection on the third day, that's the only means, that's the only power of salvation. And it's for anyone and everyone who will humble themselves and admit, I'm a sinner, I need Jesus, I need a Savior. And Jesus is the only Savior. He's the only one that can give you eternal life. You must believe in Him, receive Him as Lord and Savior. And once a person comes to Christ... God removes all the sin from our lives, and He removes the barriers that once separated us from others. So Paul says it like this in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. In other words, whoever is saved by Jesus is equal in the eyes of God. There's none, no one better than you, and there is no one that you are better than. I mean, we're equal at the foot of the cross. Jesus is the head of the body. We're just the various body parts. The only differences we have in Christ are the various gifts and talents that the Holy Spirit has distributed to each one of us. 
And, and he's given us different roles and responsibilities. He's entrusted these things to us. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11, But one and the same Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, works all these things, talking about the gifts, distributing to each one individually as he wills. And so we appreciate one another's gifts and talents. It's not competition. It should always be complementary. And so we should be encouraging and exhorting one another to use whatever gifts and talents God has given you to glorify God, to edify those around you, to build up the body of Christ, and to minister and reach out to a lost and dying world around us. That is why we're still here on planet Earth. So here, it looks like Jethro has come to believe and trust the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so what a reunion this must have been. By the way, here's uh, something else to think about uh, as we look at this scene here. Moses, a Jewish man, marries a Gentile, Zipporah, and then she goes safely to be with her father while God pours out his wrath upon Egypt. Again, Egypt represents the world. Then later, Moses and his wife are reunited. In other words, the wife of Moses is a type of the church. Moses is a type of Jesus. And just as Moses took a Gentile bride, Jesus has taken a bride made up of Gentiles and Jews. And any day now, when the rapture takes place, we, the bride of Christ, will be sent to our Father's house. And then God's wrath will be poured out on this Egypt, this world. And God will pour out His wrath during a seven-year period known as the Great Tribulation Time. Now, for us, the rapture is not just protection from God's wrath, but it should also be a glorious time when we first meet Jesus and see Him face to face. And this is when the groom receives his bride. I've done a lot of weddings over the years, and one of the things I, I like to do when I'm up here or wherever it is, I'll be standing next to the groom, and I'll watch the groom when the bride comes around the corner and she's in her gown and she's just looking beautiful and radiant, I'll always look at the groom because more often than not, he starts crying. And he knows, man, I'm over my head. You know, he realizes, I'm, I'm, I got the better end of this deal. And so, but I mean, it'll just be a, an awesome time, an awesome scene because, you know, he just sees... The, you know, I see just the love that they have for one another. And I think it's going to be even more amazing when we see Jesus face to face. The joy in our eyes, the joy in the eyes of Jesus, is going to be incredible. I mean, this is what Hebrews 12, 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the joy that he had was not only fulfilling the Father's will and being the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the world, but also knowing what his death, burial, and resurrection would accomplish. The joy of knowing, I'm going to set captives free. I'm going to bring a bride to myself, and it's going to be men and women, boys and girls from every tribe, tongue, nation, and people who are going to receive me as Lord and Savior, and I can't wait until they are in my presence. Now, I say that, and some of you are thinking, really, you think Jesus is going to think that? Well, yes, we, I believe that totally, because this is one of the things Jesus prayed in the what we refer to as the real Lord's Prayer in John 17, where he prays first for the twelve and then he prays for all of us and future believers. And this is for all of us. He says in John 17, verse 24, Jesus praying to the Father, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me, again, that's you and I, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. And so that desire Jesus has is that he wants to be with us, and he wants us to be with him. In fact, Jesus even tells us in John 14, verses 2 and 3, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. This is what the groom would do 
before they consummated the marriage. He would go and add on to his father's house. Then he would go and get his bride and bring her back to the father's house. That's what Jesus is doing now, preparing a place for us. So I go and prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Those are the words of a bridegroom to his bride. Anyway, here's Moses, here's Jethro, here's all the elders of Israel having this great meal, this great conversation about all that God has been doing in the midst of the Israelites. And from all indications, you know, it looks like this Midian priest, the Midian priest, it says, he's the top dog, has come to faith in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's a follower now of Yahweh. Verse 13 this is the next day. So it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people, and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. Can you imagine? The next morning, Moses gets up. He sits before this long line of people from sunrise to sunset. He's out there, sitting there, everybody standing in the sun, in line with all their problems, with all their complaints. Man, my wife doesn't know how to cook manna. You know, I'm tired of banana bread. I'm tired of manicotti. And they bring every complaint. They bring every complaint to Moses. And he's trying to sort it all out all day long. And I'm sure, because remember, they've been in places for like three weeks. And they're just hanging out, camping. And so I'm sure these lines were every day. They were just hanging out in a place. And people from morning to evening with all their problems. Now, when Jethro hears about this, about what Moses is doing, he will have some great advice for him. Look at verse 14. So when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people, he said, what is this thing that you are doing for the people? Why do you, notice, why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening? Again, Jethro, he's just heard from Moses, all these amazing things Moses has been used by God in doing. It's just been one miracle after another. He stood before Pharaoh, the Red Sea parts. They go on dry land. God drowns the soldiers. There's manna from heaven, water from the rock. Every single day, it's crazy. It's hectic. It's go, go, go. And so Moses gets a day off. What's he do? Stands before this long line of people listening to everybody's problem. And Jethro is looking at Moses and basically he says, What in the world are you doing? Why are you alone standing before all these people? Verse 15, Moses said to his father-in-law, Because the people come to me to inquire of God. When they have a difficulty, they come to me. And I judge between one another one and another, and I make known the statutes of God and his laws. So you got to hand it to Moses. He's taking his role responsibility very seriously here, but who in their right mind would think it's a good idea to lead two and a half to three million people by yourself? Not a good plan, but this is very common. This is a problem with a lot of people. I mean, people can become addicted to their job. They can become addicted to their hobbies. They can become addicted to ministry. It's not a good thing to be addicted to ministry. On one hand, it's very satisfying serving the Lord, being in ministry, serving others. But ministry can also mess up your priorities because your priorities must always be God first. Your relationship with Jesus must come first. Then your next responsibility is to your spouse. Then to your family. Then ministry. If you flip that over, you've got big problems. Moses is the pastor of the biggest congregation ever. <laughs> Two and a half million people, most of them grumbling and complaining. So there's got to be a lot of stress in all that he's facing. I mean... I've seen a lot of good ministries and ministers go under and they crash because they simply burn out. Some people in ministry have the false idea that exhaustion is next to godliness. No, it's not. Obviously, we all go through various seasons of life when this 
life gets busy, life is hectic, there's difficulties, there's hardships, and the Bible has a lot to say about perseverance and hard work, being diligent, and Moses certainly loved the Lord and was trying his hardest to minister to the people, but even Jethro knew. He's a baby believer. This isn't good, Moses. What you're doing is not right. People often say about ministry, well, I'd rather burn out than rust out. Either way, you're out. <laughs> so it's not a good plan. It's better to have a balanced life so that you neither rust out nor burn out. So look at verse 17. So Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that you do is not good. I like that. It's just, you're just wearing yourself out. This isn't good. Verse 18, Both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out. For this thing is too much for you. You are not able to perform it by yourself. Now, maybe this is a word of the Lord for some of you, especially if you're a workaholic. This is too much for you. And like we'll see with Moses, maybe you need to make some serious changes in your life. Maybe you need to get your priorities in order. Maybe restructure your time and your schedule. Because if you don't, you will eventually burn out. You will crash and burn. Years ago, I tried to warn someone who was very close to our family, you are a classic workaholic. You're the first one at the office. You're the last one to leave, usually two or three hours after everybody else has gone home. Your wife is miserable. She says she's got dinner ready. You say, I'll be home in two or three minutes, and you're not home for two or three hours. And you don't even get home and be with your kids, and they're frustrated. They feel like the job comes before them. And so something needs to change quickly before you lose it all. And he made some serious changes that lasted about, like any addict, about three months. And then he went right back to his old ways. And I just watched him spiral out, his family spiral out. They ended up in divorce. The kids were frustrated with him till he died. So sad. And he was very close to us. He went right back to those old ways. And so Moses was definitely on that same path. And so his father-in-law will now give him three solutions to get his priorities back in order. So look at verse 19. We'll go back to these verses, but let's just read through this. Listen now to my voice. I will give you counsel, and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people, so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes and the laws, and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you, but every small matter they themselves shall judge. So it will be easier for you, for they will bear the burden with you. If you do this thing, and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure." And all this people will also go to their place in peace. So Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So they judged the people at all times, the hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves, then Moses let his father-in-law depart, and he went his way to his own land. It means he went to his own place. So in a nutshell, Jethro is telling Moses, you're killing yourself, you're frustrating all the people. So again, back in verse 19, that's the very first thing he says that you need to do. Moses, you need to stand before God. In other words, you need to put God first and foremost. You need to seek His will, get His word for your life. Moses, you need personal time with God, a time where just you and God spend time together. 
And man, oh man, is Jethro right on here. If we think we can, you know, just skate through life and neglect our one-on-one -on -one time with the Lord, we won't be living the kind of life that God wants us to live. You cannot give to others what you yourselves do not possess. Pastor Chuck used to say, you can't give somebody measles unless you got measles yourself. Kind of a weird way to put it, but yeah, you know what I mean. You can't give out what you don't receive from the Lord. Oswald Chambers once said, one of our greatest enemies to our relationship to Christ can be our service for Christ. That's something Christians have dealt with for the last 2,000 years. It's always a challenge to find time to just quietly hang out with Jesus each and every day. But it's so important. You and I, you can call it whatever you want. You can say I, your quiet time or your devotional time. You know, people have different ways and means of having that quiet time. But you just need to spend time with the Lord in His Word because that's how and when we get recharged, we get refilled, we get regenerated, refreshed by the Holy Spirit of God and the Word of God. It's common sense. I mean, if you don't charge, recharge your batteries, and a lot of you, we have, you know, electric drills, electric saws, whatever. If you don't recharge those batteries, it doesn't work. If your battery's not recharged in your car, it's not going to go anywhere. If your battery's dead in your toothbrush, your breath will stink. So you need to recharge. You get the picture. Now, going back to my playing days when I was in high school and college, I ended up with a nickname called Stretch. Not because I was tall and lanky, but because as a pitcher, I would, I'd spend a lot of time stretching, mostly my legs, but stretching every day. And I, I would stretch for 20, 30 minutes every day. And for whatever stupid reason, I still do. It helps. But I stretch 20 to 30 minutes every day, and I use that time for my devotional time with the Lord. I'll have my Bible open, and I'll read through a section. I'll use that time to pray just as I'm stretching. Some people will do it while they're on their elliptical rider. Some people like to go for long walks and just talk to the Lord and pray. You need to find that time to get recharged from the Lord. I've read through the Bible almost 35 times now, and I would say much of that time was while I was stretching. The point is we all need to spend time with Jesus in his word every day. Our relationship with Christ is first and foremost. Jesus wrote seven letters in the New Testament, right? Some of you are like, uh, did Jesus write a letter? Where is that? <laughs> he wrote seven letters in the New Testament. They're all found in the book of Revelation. Chapters 2 and 3 are the seven letters to the seven churches that Jesus wrote. His first letter was to the church of Ephesus. You look at the book of Acts, and then you look at Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. It's one of the great letters in the Bible. They were one of the most powerful churches in the Word of God. And for that first part of the first century, they were doing amazing things. And then Jesus, by the end of the first century, writes a letter to them, and he commends them on how hard they were working, kind of like Moses. But this is what Jesus says. He points out something to them that just shook them to the core. Revelation 2, verses 2 through 5, Jesus says to them, I know your works, your labor, your patience. This is all good stuff. And that you cannot bear those who are evil and have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars, so they could spot false teachers and false apostles. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. So this is a on-fire, strong, healthy-looking church. Nevertheless, and when Jesus says this to him, and as the pastor's reading this letter after John wrote it, dictating Jesus' letter, and he sends it to Ephesus, and the pastor there reads this? Nevertheless, what's he saying, nevertheless? I have this against you. We're doing all this good stuff, Lord. How could you have anything against us? Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left, not lost, but you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless 
you repent. Again, on the outside, they look like they had everything together, but Jesus cut right to the heart of the matter, and he lets them know, without me, you can do nothing. Seek me first. Draw close to me. Get back to that first love relationship where you just knew that I loved you and I couldn't wait to hang out with you. I mean, that's his heart towards you and me. He loves us and he wants us to draw near to him. Nevertheless, I have against you, you've left your first love. That phrase, first love, refers to a honeymoon type of love. I don't know about your honeymoon, but mine was awesome. I mean, it was new, it was fresh, it was exciting. Uh, you know, we abstained, and then it was like, wow, this is amazing. And Jesus says, I want that passion. You and me, that love, where did it go? That's what he's saying to the church of Ephesus. So get back to that first love relationship. The second thing we see here from Jethro is that he tells Moses in verse 20, teach the people the statutes and the laws of God. In other words, only after you spend that time with the Lord, Moses, and you're recharged, now start teaching the people what you've learned, what God is showing you. Build them up. Strengthen them. That comes through the Word of God. Teach the people the Word of God so that they can grow in their relationship with the Lord, so then they learn how to apply God's Word to their lives so they can help each other grow. It's so important. It's not a one-man show. That's why we go verse by verse through the Bible, because, you know, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. And part of being a disciple of Jesus is to consistently be under biblical teaching. We all need to be in the Word. And we need the Lord, we need His Word, strengthening us so that we can now teach others also. We do this here, we do this, and where we're really seeing an impact is in India, in our ministry in Northeast India, that's the whole gist of what we're doing up there. When I go, I teach the church planters, who in turn teach other church planters. And it just keeps on going and growing because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You just start witnessing to others. This is exactly what Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, verse 2. Paul says, notice the four generations here, and the things you have heard from me, so Paul, telling this to Timothy, there's two, things you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these two faithful men, there's the third generation, who will be able to teach others also. So we've got four generations right there. And so receive God's word, not only from me, but from other solid Bible teachers. Let the Holy Spirit grow you and mature you, and then you'll be amazed how the Lord will open up doors for you to witness to others, for you to testify of God's goodness and grace. Now, the third thing Jethro tells Moses is to take those men who are growing and maturing and put them over the various portions of the congregations, you know, some over thousands, some over hundreds, some over fifties, some over tens. And so Moses, don't ever think you're alone in ministry. God wants to raise up many more who can help carry the load. And this pattern has been carried out throughout the Bible. This is what Jesus did. He had 12 disciples. One was a bum, but he had 12 disciples, 11, 12 if you count Saul of Tarsus that Jesus picked later, and with those 12, he literally turned the world upside down. Even in the book of Acts, you know, the unbelievers are saying, these are the men that are turning their world upside down. Well, right side up is what it should say, because they were bringing people to Christ. The same is true for us. Did you also notice the men Moses was to look for? Again, notice these were slaves. Most of them are just bricklayers, shepherds. But Jethro tells him, look for men who are men of character. First of all, he says, those who fear God. That's first and foremost. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Then he says, choose men of truth. In other words, they speak truth and they live by the truth. They are the same at home and as this, you know, they're the same wherever they are, whether it's here or at home. You're the same person. You know, too often I'll hear of people, 
They put their feet on the holy ground in the parking lot here, 492 Morning Glory Lane. And all of a sudden, their feet hit that pavement. Ooh, they're so holy and righteous. And then they get back in their car, go home, and they turn into somebody else. That's not being a man or a woman of truth. You're the same whether you're here or out there. That's what you're to pick, he says, men of truth. Thirdly, he says, they hate covetousness. In other words, they're not in ministry to be motivated by money. That's why you, know, you can't be manipulated. You can't be bribed. And these are essential. Not only with church leaders, these should be essential with our government leaders. This is why our country's in such a mess right now. We don't have hardly any, but I'm glad we got a new speaker. Mike Johnson, pray for that guy. He's on fire Christian. He loves Israel. He's under attack. Why? Because he's a Christian. So many people, oh man, he's a white supremacist. Are you kidding me? The guy loves everybody. The guy's a born-again Christian. But he's a man of that fears God, man of truth, and he is he hates covetous. But you look at all these people in Congress, Senate, even our president with four mansions, multi-million dollar places they're living in on a servant's salary. How do they do it? Because they are manipulated. They take bribes. It's just sick. Our nation is in trouble because our leadership is in trouble. Anyway, get off of that tangent for a second. Moses humbles himself before Jethro. Moses receives this godly counsel from this new believer, this Gentile. How do we know it's, it took? Because 40 years after this, Deuteronomy is written. Deuteronomy is written in the last year that Moses is alive. And look at these verses in Deuteronomy chapter 1. We'll close here in just a minute, so hang in there. Broncos don't lose until 2. <laughs> so you got plenty of time. Deuteronomy or 2.20, whenever it starts. So this is Moses at the end of his life. And he says in Deuteronomy 1 verse 9... And I spoke to you at that time, saying, I alone am not able to bear you. The Lord your God has multiplied you, and here you are today as the stars of heaven in multitude. May the Lord God of your fathers make you a thousand times more numerous than you are, and, and bless you as he has promised you. How can I alone bear your problems and your burdens and your complaints? Choose wise, understanding, and knowledgeable men from among your tribes, and I will make them heads over you. And you answered me and said, The thing which you have told us to do is good. So I took the heads of your tribes, wise and knowledgeable men, and made them heads over you, leaders of thousands, leaders of hundreds, leaders of fifties, leaders of tens, and officers of your tribes. And I commanded your judges at that time, saying, Hear the cases between your brethren, and judge righteously between a man and his brother, or the stranger who is with him. You shall not show partiality in judgment. You shall hear the small as well as the great. You shall not be afraid in any man's presence, for the judgment is God's. The case that is too hard for you, bring to me, and I will bear it. And I commanded you at that time all the things which you should do. And that's what they kept doing. And so Moses heeded the advice of his father-in-law, Jethro. Well, the same plan was implemented in the early church. You know, the disciples are just going for it. You know, the 12, we're seeing multitudes of people getting saved, 3,000 at Pentecost, 2,000 more, when Peter's used to heal the guy at the beautiful gate, and it's just getting overwhelming. And you get to Acts chapter 6, and there's just so many people, and there's so many needs. So in Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 2, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Nothing wrong with serving tables. They've been doing it, but it's, get, it's getting overwhelming. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And that was so very important that they keep praying, stay in the word of God. 
And here's the heart behind this. If we neglect the ministry of the word, we will doom the church to infancy. We will doom the church to carnality. We will make the church vulnerable to false teachings, to unbalanced doctrines. But when God's word is taught and his people are growing, then the body of Christ operates properly with Jesus as the head of the body. And that's why we have elders here. I'm just an elder that teaches. We have deacons. I mean, we have the women's ministry, and there's great leaders in the women's ministry. And there, we've got a lot of leaders doing a lot of different things. It's not a one-man show. Jesus is the one we look to. Amen?